Hi, I'm Liz Sharp. I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner and a vascular access specialist. We're here today to talk about Lyme care in the NICU, what's better and what's best. These are my objectives and my disclosures. Why are we talking about Lyme care in the NICU today? Your insertion procedure is the foundation, but Lyme care is the critical substance of CLABSI prevention in the NICU. The impact, I think, is multifactorial, and it is personal for our babies and their families, and if that baby stays as long as 31 days due to eclipsy, that is quite significant. It is fiscally disruptive to the organizations when we can see that an expected increase in cost is about $90,000, and when institutions are struggling to maintain the fiscal viability in an environment that provides for pay for performance, increasingly penalizing reimbursement. When we think about this professionally, it's important for us as professionals and clinicians to consider the risk factors. And some of these risk factors are those we have known for some time. For example, prematurity, immaturity of the skin barrier, and immature immune response. And these are the patients that come to us with the highest demands for IV therapy, which also means that they then need those for the most period of time, for an extended period of time. They also require sometimes multiple breaks in the line and perhaps there are candidates for multiple lumen catheters. These both predispose them to increased risk for CLABSI. Recent data has shown that the presence of intra-abdominal pathology and abdominal surgery in the seven days preceding eclapsy are recognized as risk factors, as well as three or more heel sticks in 48 hours preceding the onset of the eclapsy. So to, when we think about line care in the NICU, what are the best practices? And when best practices are not enough, what might you do to also be better? I think of the summary of the best practices in terms of three phases, insertion, maintenance, and monitoring and follow-up. And key pieces of the insertion strategies are having a specially trained dedicated PIC team, using maximum sterile barrier precautions, chlorhexidine or povidone, whichever antiseptic you use, using it according to the instructions, and allowing the adequate dry time specific to each agent. Considering the use of an extension set between the catheter and the needleless connector to reduce the risk of catheter manipulation because we don't want to only prevent infection, we'd like to also prevent dislodgement, migration, any other complications that could cause the patient to require an additional procedure. And finally, considering this a two-person procedure to maintain the integrity of the sterile process. For maintenance, hub care is going to be key. Disinfecting using a vigorous 15 second scrub with each entry to the line and allowing this disinfecting agent to dry before the access. Changing your needleless connectors and your IV tubing with standardization, considering this as a two person procedure minimizing your add-on devices, eliminating stopcocks, considering fluid and medication filtration. And finally, to work together, ongoing and outcome monitoring is going to be so critical and has been shown that working together has been successful. Collaborative action, incorporating all stakeholders, encouraging audits and checklists, team approach, and finally, working with your state or whatever national collaboratives might be available to you. To summarize, best practices, maximum steroid barrier precautions, skin antisepsis with drying time, hub disinfection prior to line entry, teams, specialized education, standardization, and daily review of the line, removal when no longer needed. If these strategies are not sufficient to bring you to your goal of zero CLABSI, what other strategies might be better? You may consider the use of passive disinfection devices. You may consider chlorhexidine impregnated dressings, sterile hemostatic agents, chlorhexidine bathing, and joining a collaborative.
Thank you for your attention.